Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're coming to us from. My name is Rob Rader, I'm Director of Engagement and Membership here at AGU. We are proud, along with the Atmospheric Sciences section, to present this webinar series, From the Past into the Future. This is a webinar series uh, that was presented as a session at the 2019 AGU Fall Meeting. Due to the high demand, uh, the decision by the Atmospheric Sciences section, Jim Hurrell as president and Paul Newman as the president-elect, they decided to turn this into a webinar series and invite all uh, 16, 15 speakers to present this to you over the next few weeks. So uh, if you haven't registered for the other ones, please go ahead and do so through the website. Otherwise, we are ready to go here with today's first webinar. Our speakers today are going to be Alison Steiner, who will be speaking to you on terrestrial biosphere atmosphere interactions, and Kevin Trenworth, who will be talking about Earth's changing energy budget. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started with Alison's presentation. The webinar will be archived for future viewing, so you can take a look at that on the Atmospheric Sciences website. And you will also be able to share that, that archive with any colleagues that you think might be interested. We also will have a Q&A session. Each presentation will take place for about 25 minutes, and then you will have an opportunity to use the technology using your dashboard to either raise your hand or ask a question to us through the GoToWebinar system. Without further ado, I'm going ahead and introduce Allison Steiner. Allison, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Good morning. Good morning, and thanks for this opportunity to give this presentation again, and also to the Atmospheric Sciences section for organizing this session. Um, I'm Allison Steiner from the University of Michigan, and I'll be talking about terrestrial biosphere atmosphere interactions. And you know, most atmospheric sciences tend to think about the Earth's surface predominantly as a lower boundary condition. And the numbers that are frequently cited show that from the two-dimensional space, land is taking up about maybe about a third of our Earth's surface, and the remaining fraction um, is represented by oceans. Um, but vegetation, and once we start thinking about the um, biota that's living on the Earth's surface, that introduces a third dimension in terms of how we can think about the Earth's surface area. And most simply visualized, this is often represented with a parameter known as leaf area index. And I'm showing here an animation of monthly leaf area index as derived from the MODIS satellite. And so essentially what that means is that the surface area that's provided by the structure of vegetation can often be many times larger than the ground area that the vegetation may occupy. And so the example I'm showing on the left, it uses the leaf area index or LAI as a factor of three, rep meaning that the leaf surface area is representing a factor of three greater than the ground surface. And so what we can see in this visualization is that we can see the greening of the Southern hemisphere in the, in the, of the Northern hemisphere in the summer, and also the tropics, as well as marginal changes um, within the Southern hemisphere. So if we actually plot this from a latitudinal perspective, this shows this bias where we can see a larger amount of leaf area index in the northern hemisphere. And if we account for this surface area, that means that in July, about approximately half of the Earth's surface area can be increased over land when we take into account this interpretation of leaf area index. Um, and so um, what I'd like to talk about today is how this change in leaf surface area and the processes that are happening at the surface can influence both biogeophysical processes at the Earth's surface as well as biogeochemical processes and talk a little bit about the feedback that um, those types of processes can have with the atmosphere. And from the biophysical perspective, the, um, one of the first things that people think about is the surface energy budget. We're going to hear more about the Earth's energy budget in Kevin's talk coming up next. But from the lower boundary condition, right, we have incoming solar radiation from the sun, some of that gets absorbed, some gets reflected, and then some gets absorbed into the surface of the ground. But most of that energy is being returned from the Earth's surface back to the atmosphere, either in the form of sensible heat or latent heat fluxes. Um, and this ends up being an important point in terms of how we influence uh, motions in the atmosphere. In addition to the surface energy budget, we can also think about this from the water budget perspective, where we have precipitation incoming in from the atmosphere. It can interact with the canopy. It can get intercepted or fall through to the ground and infiltrate into the surface. And then again, some of that moisture is returned back to the atmosphere through latent heat fluxes, of which transpiration is really one of the dominant mechanisms for that return of moisture. And so predominantly today, I'm going to focus on that, um, how vegetation is influencing latent heat fluxes and what that means for atmospheric science. On the other side of this diagram is the biogeochemical perspective. And so in this regard, now we're not just exchanging um, potentially energy or mass, 
we're looking at exchanges or fluxes of different nutrients such as carbon or nitrogen or also some potentially short-lived climate forcing agents or ones that can influence greenhouse gas concentrations such as biogenic volatile organic compound emissions or VOCs as well as primary biological aerosol products particles. And I'm predominantly going to focus today on feedbacks between the land surface and the atmosphere regarding VOCs and the primary biological aerosol particles. Um, so um, as we try to think about how we can capture these feedbacks within our suite of modeling and uh, observational perspectives, um, from the observations we can use in situ observations such as uh, FlexNet power observations or other ground-based monitoring sites. Uh, aircraft campaigns are frequently used also to understand the exchange of these uh, energy and mass with the atmosphere. And also there's an emerging space towards using space-based observations to try to understand some of these land surface processes as well. But to understand the feedbacks, it's often challenging to see these with observations. And this is where Earth system models come in. They're trying to represent a lot of these different processes um, as well as understand we can use them to probe and test different sensitivities to different feedbacks. So what I'd like to do this talk is kind of focus on three different questions. One is understanding what processes drive biosphere atmosphere feedbacks. The second is what challenges exist in identifying these feedbacks. And finally, what opportunities could improve their representation in predictive Earth system models. So I'm going to start on the biogeophysical side of the diagram. And because I'm talking about changes in the surface, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we represent vegetation within Earth system models. So starting with the very early first generation models, the Manabi model back in 1969, it started to introduce a surface energy budget, but there was no vegetation included in these models. Um, as models got more complex, the second generation model started by Bob Dickinson with bats and Pierce Sellers in 1986 with SIB, started to introduce a vegetation canopy. And to do so, in order to not add too much complexity to the models, they utilize something known as a big leaf parameterization where that leaf area index that I talked about in the beginning could be used to describe a canopy in terms of both sunlit and shaded leaves. Um, in order to, to build in more processes and more realism into these models, the third generation model started to introduce understanding how photosynthesis and stomatal conductance, or the opening of stomata that allow that transpiration of water vapor to occur, to be coupled within models. So by that manner, these models tried to start to introduce these processes to allow for a more realistic representation. The fourth generation models started to introduce dynamic vegetation, which would be allowing models over long time scales to be able to predict distributions of vegetation uh, types from different processes, as well as including much more complex ecosystem carbon balances. In terms of the fifth generation, or what we see now evolving with land surface models is the introduction um, in some of the global models of vegetation demographic models, which can be really important in terms of how we understand vegetation changes due to climate change. Um, so as again, modeling are one of the tools that we can use to try to understand these feedbacks. So from the biogeophysical perspective, I'd like to highlight two different types of feedbacks that we can often observe and most people are fairly familiar with. Um, the first has to do with local precipitation recycling. So in this example for the figure on the left, changes in the land surface such as soil moisture can influence the evaporative fraction or that ratio of sensible to latent heat flux, which can then go on to influence processes within the planetary boundary layer, affect the formation of clouds and precipitation, which can then further feed back to the surface. And this sort of local precipitation mechanism has been observed um, and quantified in many semi-arid regions. There's also emerging studies in terms of understanding what the contribution to the non-local moisture would be. So as evaporation is occurring in one place locally, right, it can be transported via the atmosphere and moisture fluxes to influence precipitation in other regions. And in this study by Wei and Germeyer, they actually went to quantify what that non-local contribution would be. So in the figure on the bottom, the red boxes are ones that have identified a lot of non-local precipitation. And then the moisture fluxes you can see are frequently located in different locations. Similar to precipitation, we can also see feedbacks with temperature in terms of the non-local and localness as well. So with local temperature feedbacks, it's a similar process where if perhaps we see soil drying, that can change that fraction and increase um, sensible heat as opposed to latent heat, and that can end to work to dry air within the planetary boundary layer and increase the evaporative demand. Another recent study here has shown that this process may not just be local and that heat can be advected and influence heat latitude, mid-wave, um, mid-latitude heat waves in other regions. So we can also see this non-local response with respect to temperature. Um, so try to, to try to understand and disentangle these feedbacks, the models become very important. 
So how do we represent the forest canopy in that land surface area that I talked about at the beginning? Um, and how can that be used to understand these types of fluxes? And I identify this as one of the first challenges within terrestrial biosphere atmosphere interactions, which is how do we represent the forest canopy within models? So the leaf surface area that I talked about can drive processes such as transpiration, right, which is really a dominant component of that latent heat flux. So this is a figure from a synthesis paper that used several different types of canopy models with different representations of the forest canopy. Some are the big leaf, sun leaf shade models that I showed in the earlier development. Others include multiple layers within the forest canopy. And so by comparing all of these different models, this is showing you one result from this paper at the Duke Forest, which is a FluxNet site, and showing you the change in transpiration as simulated by the models over several years. The observations are shown from the FluxNet site in terms of the black dot. And you can see there's at least a factor of two difference between these models. Some models can capture some interannual variability, but the models still struggle to re capture, re um, or really capture a lot of that observed interannual variability. So in terms of this challenge, one of the opportunities that's available is that a lot of the new satellite observations that are being launched, for example, the new suite right now that's including EcoStress, JEDI, OCO3, and HESWI are one, are one way that we can try to improve our understanding of that lower boundary condition and how we represent vegetation canopies. So while these aren't direct observations, they can really provide important constraints for models. But that leaf surface area isn't the only piece of the biogeophysical, proce the bi biogeophysical processes that we still need to try to understand. The second aspect of that is access to moisture, especially for things like transpiration rates. So soil moisture is another aspect that requires some attention. If we think about how soil moisture has evolved within Earth system models, the first generation models were using a fairly, sim a fairly simple bucket model, which allowed a certain amount of soil moisture content to be held within a bucket with inputs and outputs of precipitation, evaporation, and subsurface runoff. As models advanced to the second generation, we saw the addition of vertical structure within the subsurface and using Darcy's law to explain infiltration within the soil. And then finally, a lot of the newer third generation models have introduced detailed hydrology models such as top model of VIC to better represent those surface processes. We've also seen a big shift in terms of opportunities in terms of how remote sensing products as well can be used to understand surface soil moisture. So this is a review paper showing you several of the different satellites that have been launched over the past few decades to try to understand surface soil moisture, that first five centimeters of soil. Although I will highlight some of the challenges of this is this can be very difficult to remotely sense surface soil, surface soil moisture through vegetation. So in this figure, the hatching shows all regions that would be blocked out by dense vegetation, in which case the satellite would then be remotely sensing the canopy water content and not the soil water content. Um, so this represents another challenge because typically that means that in order to interpret root zone soil moisture or the amount of water that vegetation can access from the deeper soil, we still need models to be able to understand how that's working. And why this challenge is important is because it sort of highlights how we still struggle to capture soil moisture flux relationships. So in this, this example, I'm showing you a recent study where we've looked at and compared observed uh, transpiration fluxes or latent heat fluxes from several different flux net sites across the temperate to boreal transition region in the United States. Here we have these organized by plant functional type with deciduous trees on the left and evergreen sites on the right. And so one of the things you can see is that the deciduous sites, many times the model is under predicting that the gray boxes are much showing much higher latent heat fluxes than we, what we observe with two different versions of the community land model. Um, and for the evergreen sites, things will look a little bit better in terms of some of that of model evaluation. But if we look a little bit more closely on the temporal scale, now I'm just showing you two different sites, and this is soil water content versus latent heat flux. Um, while the overall June, July, August total might be close to the observed, we can see some differences in terms of the seasonal profile. So in the observations here, the June uh, fluxes are shown to the right-hand side. Generally, things are wetter and the fluxes are lower. As we move into the summer with more available radiation, the fluxes go up, and we can see that drying throughout the summer season where we have lower soil water content as observed at the site in August. And the model really struggles to, either model, depending on which thematic conductance parameterization you're using, really struggles to capture that seasonal cycle at both the evergreen and the deciduous sites. Um, so this represents one of the challenges in terms of how we can think about if models are able to capture these feedbacks between the atmosphere and the land surface. Now I'm going to switch over to the biogeochemical side of the story and talk a little bit about biogenic VOC emissions 
and how they can influence um, feedbacks between the atmosphere and the terrestrial biosphere. So biogenic VOC emissions um, are important. They're carbon-based compounds that tend to be very reactive and can undergo a series of reactions in the atmosphere. They get oxidized by the OH radical, and if sufficient nitrogen oxides are present, they can form the greenhouse gas tropospheric ozone, um, which is also harmful to human health. Additionally, these set of reactions can produce a suite of oxidation products that have a lower volatility than the original emission. And in many cases under atmospheric conditions, they can partition to form secondary organic aerosol, which can act as a, um, a forcing agent within the atmosphere as well. So one of the most important BVOC emissions is one that um, is known as isoprene, C5H8. And it's important because it's emitted globally at a very high rate, and it tends to be very reactive. So when we look at how isoprene has been understood throughout the history of atmospheric science, the first observations were um, actually published by a Georgian scientist in the 1950s, although a lot of those publications were not read into the West until later after the Iron Curtain came down. And then simultaneously, a little bit later in the United States, Fritz Went in 1960 wrote a paper about the blue haze that was frequently observed in regions like the Blue Ridge Mountains and attributed it to natural emissions from vegetation. Um, after people started recognizing these compounds, they found that they were also really important in terms of tropospheric ozone chemistry. And this is important both from the rural perspective as well as very urban vegetated regions in urban areas like Atlanta. And finding that it was a very important thing to factor in in terms of how we can work to abate high ozone concentration. Um, after this finding for tropospheric chemistry was um, discovered, we started to develop a lot of models in terms of regional and global emissions inventories. And it's always been an important part of tropospheric chemistry models. I would say in the last two decades, it's gotten even more attention as new chemical mechanisms have been found to show that isoprene can also influence secondary organic aerosol formation. So one of the challenges with isoprene is that it varies significantly with vegetation type. So it goes much beyond what we've seen with plant functional types and how different types of trees are represented within earth system models for the biogeophysical processes. For example, when we look at deciduous trees, species like poplar and oaks are, tend to be very high isoprene emitters, whereas in maples, for some reason, are not. And so this ends up having a big impact in terms of how we try to improve their representation with their earth system models and on tropospheric chemistry. The vertical uh, structure also matters quite a bit. Um, when we think about how we simulate forests, we know that different species are at different locations within the forest canopy. And when we've incorporated that into emissions estimates at a FluxNet site in Northern Michigan, the University of Michigan Biological Station, we found that changing the vegetation species in their structure can change isoprene emissions by up to about 35%. So the vegetation structure and where that surface area is, 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 is important for isoprene as well. But perhaps more interesting from the feedback perspective is how climate controls isoprene. So isoprene emissions are dependent upon environmental factors such as light, temperature, and the soil moisture is another one that's thought to be true. So for light and temperature, the behavior of isoprene mimics photosynthesis, although the temperature response curves are slightly different, and you can emit more isoprene at higher temperatures than you can photosynthesize. Um, for soil moisture, I've shown a parameterization that's here that's included in isoprene emission models, but this still represents a large uncertainty because it's been very difficult to get a good handle on how soil moisture constrains isoprene from laboratory and field measurements. So isoprene can be important from the perspective of how we try to understand these types of biogeochemical feedbacks between the atmosphere and the terrestrial biosphere. So as we can see in this temperature response curve, generally isoprene increases with increasing temperature. However, there's a limit to that isoprene emission. And one interesting fact to note is that we, when people have looked at the influence of ozone changes with temperature, they've also noticed that there can be a plateau with respect to how ozone increases with increasing temperature. So on the left, I'm showing you a figure from the south coast, from observations from the south coast air basin in California, where um, with increasing daily maximum temperature, we see an increase in the maximum one hour ozone concentration. But you can see over different decades, that increase has slowly started to plateau. And one of the things that we've postulized, postulated is that that may be due to the isoprene response under high temperatures. Um, another study using the GeoSchem model found that this ozone suppression could ha occur at other locations of the United States, as indicated by the red dots. And that, that study indicated that meteorological factors, such as changes in the planetary boundary layer height and stagnation events could be important as well. So no matter what the driver is, understanding this type of feedback is very important for the predictability of air quality.
And the other feedback, in addition to high temperature events, would be that from isoprene and drought. And so, as I mentioned, this is one that's been challenging to try to constrain with observations. Um, this recent study used observational evidence to show that while in the early drought years in California from 2011 to 2013, we didn't see that much change in isoprene. But when, it, when the state went into severe drought in 2014 and 2015, then we saw a substantial decrease in isoprene by about 50%, and that led to about a 20% decrease in ozone production. Modeling studies that try to incorporate this effect and look at the effect of VOCs um, on, on drought on VOCs and subsequent SOA have actually shown an increase in biogenic VOC emissions under drought and a subsequent increase in SOA. And this sort of highlights this challenge of trying to understand drivers in these sort of isoprene climate feedbacks. So the third challenge I'd like to highlight um, is that we really don't have a good handle yet on how biogenic VOC is going to respond under extreme events. And this has implications for air quality um, as we move into warmer climates. And finally, the last point I'd like to make from this figure is that while we might understand the emissions of VOCs under our current climate, it could be that under warmer climates, we actually induce other types of VOC emissions that also could be reactive and influence the formation of aerosols and influence clouds. And so one of the opportunities for addressing this challenge, again, remote sensing can play a role in here. Um, we've actually seen most recently in the past year, new retrievals of isoprene from space using the CRIS satellite. Um, and also, you know, because that data record is going to be short, one of the important things is going to be to understand the long-term drivers. This is going to require long-term monitoring sites. And there are very few records that we have of long-term measurements of isoprene fluxes. One of the longest that we have is at the University of Michigan Biological Station, although that is discontinuous in nature. Um, and so this represents one of the, the challenges as well in terms of how we can try to understand these feedbacks. Um, the next biogeochemical feedback I'd like to focus on has to do with the introduction of aerosols to the atmosphere. These are short-lived climate forcer, and we know that they can have both direct aerosol effects, meaning that they can scatter and absorb incoming radiation, and then they can also have indirect aerosol effects, where these types of particles can act as cloud condensation, cloud condensation nuclei, or also as ice nucleating particles that can influence the formation and persistence of clouds, and hence the global energy budget. So one that I'd like to focus on is that between aerosols and the forest canopy and light penetration. So as we add aerosols to the atmosphere, they can in induce the direct effect, which can actually to work to overall reduce the total amount of radiation reaching the surface. But it also can increase the amount of diffuse or scattered radiation. So showing this, uh, looking at this, this is a photosynthetic, photosynthetic response curve for photosynthesis. And if we think about this upper and lower canopy, and our upper canopy, right, the sun leaves that are re receiving a lot of that direct sunlight, they might expect to see a reduction in the total amount of light that re they receive due to the presence of aerosols. However, as that diffuse effect goes up, we might expect that we would see more radiation reaching the lower canopy. And if that lower canopy factor outweighs the upper canopy loss, we could see an increase in productivity within the forest canopy due to the presence of aerosols or clouds. Um, so observational studies do suggest that we see a weak influence of diffuse light on fluxes. Um, this is an example from a study that looked at, they saw a weak decrease in carbon fluxes with increasing aerosol optical depth, or essentially meaning that the forests are taking up more carbon under moderate aerosol loading. Yet if that's true, we should see a relationship with the surface energy fluxes, and that's something that's been harder to disentangle. So there's a lot of site variability within these responses, but overall what we noticed when we were looking at flux net observations was that increasing aerosol concentrations led to an overall decrease in surface energy fluxes, which creates an inconsistency in terms of how we think about how forest canopies might respond to aerosols. Several recent modeling studies have promoted the importance of this diffuse effect, again, showing increases in GPP by aerosols in the study on the left across a lot of the northern hemisphere, and another study which postulated a feedback directly related to biogenic VOC emissions, which could form their own secondary organic aerosols and influence and promote additional carbon uptake. But one of the challenges I'd like to highlight is that what we see the models doing appears to overestimate this diffuse effect. So if we look at this, this is a figure of the total visible light on the x-axis as compared to gross primary production or GPP on the y-axis at the University of Michigan Biological Station. These are colored by the diffuse fraction where yellow colors are showing higher diffuse fractions. So generally at lower light levels, we tend to see more diffuse. But as you go up along into higher light levels, you can still see that the diffuse radiation is influencing GPP throughout that distribution. Um, in contrast, when we look at what the model's doing, and this is an example using the 
CLM multi-layer model, you can see a very different pattern with the diffuse radiation, where a more diffuse very strongly promotes the GPP. And this is leading us to start to think that the models actually may be overestimating this diffuse effect within the model. Um, and then the last piece I'd like to highlight is this influence on the indirect effect and how these particles may affect clouds. Um, and so the net final challenge that I'd like to highlight is the inclusion of biological particles in cloud interactions. And the reason why I'm highlighting these biological particles is because they're really important in terms of how we understand what the pre-industrial aerosol forcing looks like. And this is one example from our research group here at Michigan, where we've been looking at the emissions of primary biological particles such as pollen, which are emitted very frequently in the northern latitudes by a lot of different types of vegetation. Atmospheric scientists have typically thought that pollen grains are too large to be impor that important in the atmosphere. However, recent work has shown that once under moist conditions at relative humidities 80% or higher, pollen grains can actually rupture and create lots of tiny particles which are organic in nature and can act as cloud condensation, cloud condensation nuclei. And this could lead to a, a, a sort of aerosol indirect effect where we would increase the cloud droplet number concentration and have the potential to suppress rain. So one of the opportunities I think here with respect to the biological particles is we have a lot of new measurement techniques coming online, such as fluorescence and things like metabolomics that could provide important new constraints on biological particles. Because right now we really have a very poor understanding of these types of particles and their contribution within the Earth system. So with that, I'd just like to highlight again, uh, I've sort of brought up five challenges within this, within this talk. One is how we represent that forest canopy within Earth system models, how those models are capturing soil moisture flux relationships, and then from the biogeochemical side, how VOCs might be changing and influencing atmospheric chemistry under extreme events, these diffuse radiation effects on the canopy, and finally, these biogenic aerosol cloud interactions. And from that perspective, um, in terms of Earth needs for the community, we're hoping that models are really be able to progress to be able to accurately capture these feedbacks because that will really help in terms of predictive capacities for future Earth system model simulations. And then the observations still represent a very important piece of that where the need for higher space and time resolution observations will be very crucial for identifying these feedbacks. And so with that, I just place up some acknowledgements and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Really appreciate that great talk. Um, so we've got the questions are open for folks that would like to ask Allison a question. You're welcome to do so using the questions box. Go ahead and type your question. I'll be happy to relay that to Allison. Or you can go ahead and raise your hand using your dashboard, and we can then select you. And if you've got a mic or if you're on, our, on the phone today, uh, you can ask Allison your question on the mic. We've got about four or five minutes for Q&A. So we'll let this uh, sit for a bit and see what questions come in. Okay, Richard, if you're okay, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you so you can ask Allison your question. Um, oh, wait. Oh. that again it's not allowing me to unmute you for some reason Richard uh, shows that you're connected to audio hmm attendee is muted click to unmute it's showing that you're self muted I think that could be why it's not allowing me so if you can unmute yourself there you yeah. go there yeah, you go okay. Richard welcome hi yeah uh, great talk uh, I didn't uh, hear any mention of uh, wildfires. I would assume that's also uh, biogeochemical uh, feedback, uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, feedback going both ways, uh, including uh, what types of plants you're going to end up with uh, after the wildfire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know there's a lot of interest in the atmospheric chemistry community on this biogeochemical side in terms of what types of trace gases and particles that are increasing. Um, the one study that I highlight, the UA and Unger study, they actually did that look at diffuse radiation specifically from fires and also from anthropogenic uh, emissions, if you're interested in that feedback specifically for fires. Mm -hmm. Right. And then in terms of you know succession, I think that's something where the dynamic vegetation models you know, over long time scales could be looking at that change in vegetation mm -hmm. composition as well. 
So do these uh, fifth generation models you were talking about that include the um, types of uh, plans, uh, are they fully interactive that they will also uh, adjust uh, with the developing climate? Um, so I think it, it depends on the model. Um, so some of the, you know, in terms of dynamic vegetation model, there's one of the biggest uh, differences I would say across Earth system models is how they do represent fire um, in terms of both what ignites fires, um, where they occur, and then what impact that has on the vegetation. So I would say some of them do include that type of feedback and, and some do not. There's a lot of variability there. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Greg, you're muted now. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no other questions coming in at the moment. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to do so uh, in the questions pane or raise your hand and we can go ahead and call on you. Uh, so it's probably didn't hear me thank Richard for his question because I was muted. Um, let's see. Got about one more minute before we move to Kevin's presentation for questions. Looks like Richard might have another question. Yeah, uh, sorry, um, no more, more comment. Uh, I don't know whether you are aware of uh, ARMS, uh, the DOE Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program will move the uh, mobile facility from Oliktok to the Southeast US. And they're currently looking for input on siting where that should be located. This is a five year deployment of a very uh, a lot of uh, atmospheric instrumentation and they're focusing on the southeast us and and that's an area that should be of prime interest to you too yes i'm actually on the project team for the site selection so oh, yeah, okay. involved, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so we just had our first meeting last week so yeah we're really i'm really excited about the prospect of that new site yeah okay thank you mm -hmm. thank so you. we are at time for allison allison thank you so much for your great presentation really appreciate it uh, we do have a link that I share to Allison's abstract, so you can feel free to go ahead and take a look at that. And again, we'll be sharing this recording with you all, so anything you may have missed, you'll be able to catch, catch again. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the, the presentation over to Kevin Trenberth. Kevin? Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's see if we can get this going. Sure. Here we go, I think. Good to go. So I'm going to talk about Earth's changing energy budget as such and what the implications are on uh, a global basis and then toward the end on a regional basis. And so the big picture is, of course, we have the sun uh, shining radiation onto the planet Earth, which is, uh, which is more like a sphere. And as a result, there's a lot more radiation received near the tropics and much less at high latitudes, whereas the outgoing long-wave radiation depends upon temperature, uh, ab uh, absolute temperature, and is much more uniform. And so we get a distribution of net radiation on the left side of this panel, which requires heat transports by especially the atmosphere and the ocean in order to balance the overall radiation budget. This is work that I've done in conjunction with uh, John Fasulo and Yongchen Zhang and Li Jing Chang uh, in particular. So uh, one reason this is an interesting topic is because of the diversity of different kinds of energy and the complexity that occurs. So the incoming radiation is a shortwave radiant energy and it gets transformed into internal heat, which relates to temperature, potential energy, which relates to gravity and height, uh, latent energy, which relates to phase changes, and kinetic energy, which relates to motion. And all of these can be moved around in various ways by both the atmosphere and the ocean in particular. They can get stored and sequestered by the various components in the climate system, and ultimately they get radiated back to space as long wave radiation, infrared radiation. 
And with an equilibrium climate, there is a balance between these overall flows of energy and they drive the weather systems and the currents in the ocean, but they can also be perturbed through climate change. So here's the uh, overall picture of how the global mean surface temperature is changing. This is actually the NOAA record. I've got on here the pre-industrial temperature, and you can see that 2016 is the warmest year on record. I've got uh, 2019 in here, which is the second warmest on record. There's a general increasing trend. It's a bit more ragged as you go back in time, and some of that is artificial because of less complete uh, observations, but there is still quite large natural variability. So uh, we can add to this the uh, annual values of carbon dioxide before 1957. These are based upon bubbles of air and ice cores. And after 1957, this is based upon the Mauna Loa record. And uh, I put these together in a way to suggest that there's a relationship between them because we can prove that there is. The pre-industrial value is 280 parts per million by volume, and the zero line on both of these curves is the 20th century average. And so now we're up at 410 parts per million by volume, and, uh, and there's a striking relationship between them. Now, half of that increase has occurred since 1985. So this is during the lifetime of probably everyone who's listening, listening here, and it's accelerating. It's not decreasing in spite of things like the Kyoto Protocol or the Paris Agreement. And so this is a real problem. However, I would argue that the most fundamental measure that the climate is changing is actually the Earth's energy imbalance. One of the reasons that's important is that it is the net result of all of the complicated feedbacks. You know, the main approach that's used to climate change is to estimate what is often referred to as radiator forcing, put it into a climate model, simulate all of the complicated feedbacks. And there are many which we don't do very well, like clouds and aerosols and so on, and some that Allison talked about. And uh, here we're looking at the end result of all of these. And so this has a tremendous advantage in many ways. So this is a schematic of the overall flows of energy through the global climate system annual average uh, as a function of the vertical. And I'm not gonna dwell on most of these, but I will focus on the top values, uh, which are given to an extra decimal point because the energy imbalance here is 0.9 watts per square meter. The only difference between uh, this version and the 2009 version we published is uh, that we have included the, the scattering and reflection of the downwelling long wave radiation, uh, which actually helps us balance the surface energy budget better. And so this relates to the surface emissivity of the oceans of 0.97. So here's the more uh, regional aspects. The absorbed solar radiation is given at the top. This is 2000 to 2016. The outgoing long wave radiation is in the second panel and the net, the sum of these two is given at the bottom. The top two panels both have quite distinctive cloud signatures. A high cloud uh, is bright and it reflects radiation, but it also emits at lower temperatures. And as a result, there's tremendous amount of cancellation between these two. And we don't see the, a, a lot of the cloud signatures in many places in the net, except where there's low strata cumulus and also in desert regions. <clears throat> so the overall energy imbalance uh, is around about, let's just round it off to one watt per square meter. And for to get a sense of what that means, a Christmas tree light is about 0.4 watts. Uh, globally, if you add up this one watt per square meter, that's about 500 terawatts. A terawatt is uh, 10 to the 12, 12 zeros after the value. And for comparison, the US in 2018 electric uh, consumption was about 1.28 terawatts. And the global electricity generation is estimated to be about 5.7 terawatts. And so the energy imbalance is a factor of 85 to 90 times the global electricity generation. Now that tells you that this energy imbalance is really very, very large. 
And in fact, the direct effects of humans are small, except locally in cities. And it's mainly through the interference of the, of the, with the natural flows of energy through the climate system that, that matters for climate change. Then the second aspect of this is that one watt per square meter is quite small compared, the overall compared with the overall flow of energy through the climate system, which is you know, the difference between the incoming solar and the reflected uh, and the outgoing long wave radiation are both of order 240 watts per square meter. And so one part in 240 means you can't go outside and say, oh, I can feel global warming. You, that's not how climate change is experienced. Instead, it has to accumulate, and it does so under certain circumstances because it's always in the same direction. So what happens to this extra heat that we've got? Well, it warms the land and the atmosphere. It goes into the ocean and that uh, the ocean expands. Uh, it melts land ice and both of those then raise sea level. It melts sea ice and warms the waters. And it evaporates moisture and causes changes in rainstorms and clouds. And this is the main complication that exists. But a lot of this amazingly balances out over a period of about five months. And it turns out that over 90%, some 93% ends up going into the ocean. So one place that the energy accumulates is in the melting of ice. Uh, so glaciers are melt. There's a lot of pictures like the one I've shown here of Muir Glacier and also Arctic sea ice is down over 40%. This is the September value uh, at the, at the uh, peak of the summertime, a loss of uh, Arctic sea ice, and the overall uh, rate is 13% per decade. So th this is one place that uh, the energy accumulates. There was some spectacular melting in Greenland last summer in 2019, uh, especially around early August. And the picture on the left is from the NSIDC website showing uh, water rushing down moulons and, and uh, creating channels in the ice. And the ice is also showing up as being quite dirty. If we estimate the overall of, uh, effects of uh, the melting of ice, it turns out to be about 14 terawatts. So globally, that's about 0 0.03 watts per square meter. And of course, this is partly because the coverage of snow and ice is over a fairly small portion of the globe. So what about land? Well, if the land is wet, a lot of the heat goes into evaporation, evapotranspiration. But in a drought, the heat can accumulate. It only takes one little rainstorm and the, a lot of the accumulation effects tend to vanish. And so the heat goes into firstly drying and then secondly heating. And as the temperature uh, rises, so the evaporative demand of the atmosphere also increases. And if you have one watt per square meter over a month and you accumulate that, that's equivalent to 720 watts per square meter over one hour. In other words, to 720 hours in a month. And 720 watts is the equivalent to the power of a small microwave oven. One square meter is about 10 square feet. So let's say it's one microwave oven at full power every square foot over the planet for six minutes. No wonder things catch on fire. Now, this is a physical argument. This is not trying to deal with the awful data sets and the statistics of how fire, wildfire in Australia or, or, uh, or California or in Southern Europe is changing. Instead, this is a physical argument and it says that things have to dry out and it has consequences for the risk of wildfire. So the non-ocean component overall is about 0 0.07 watts per square meter. So what about the oceans, the ocean heat content? So we've updated this curve now uh, through 2019. 2019 is the warmest year overall for the oceans uh, by quite a substantial amount. 2018 is second, 2017 is third, 2015 is fourth, and there's a small dip. Uh, where are we here? In, in, in 2016, uh, and 
And that was because of the big El Nino event that occurred at that time, and that put extra heat into the atmosphere, especially through evaporation and, and latent heating of the atmosphere. And it took heat out of the ocean. But even that big El Nino effect is relatively a small blip in the overall ocean heat content. I put the uh, Mauna Loa record on top of this to suggest that there's a relationship between the two. And the uncertainty of the ocean heat content record uh, increases as you go back before about 1990, which is when altimetry uh, began, the uh, sea level measurements from space. Whoops. There we go. So we can also measure the distribution of this in the ocean. This is not quite up to date. But uh, the biggest warming is in the Southern Oceans and in the North Atlantic. There are some places where it's cooled and that relates to the ocean circulation, which, which is a little bit like that. So some of the heat gets carried down and some of the cool waters from below get, get brought up. But uh, you know, it's warming just about everywhere over, over the oceans. And this is the, uh, these are somewhat smoothed values, but this looks at different layers, zero to th 300. Uh, 300 to 700 meters and you can see the main penetration of heat has really not occurred below about 300 meters until after about the late 1980s or thereabouts and it's gradually penetrated uh, deeper and deeper and 93% uh, pretty much matches what's happening at the top of the atmosphere with regard to radiation so a consequence of this is that sea level rises uh, this is the overall sea level rise record, and uh, this is affected by El Nino. There's a big blip here, which was a La Nina event. It rained a lot over Australia and formed a big lake called Lake Eyre and took about five millimeters of water out of the global ocean. But there are also other parts of the world, North America and, and parts of Asia, that uh, had uh, large amounts of snow and, and water on land at that time. And in general, during El Nino's, uh, it's... Um, uh, there is more drought over land. So uh, this is again evidence of the ocean heat content increasing uh, as well as the melt of ice. So the challenges then are can we say a lot more about what's going on if we do this locally? So here's the extra challenges that exist. We have the radiation at the top of the atmosphere and at the surface. We've got the evaporative fluxes and the sensible heat fluxes. And so the net surface flux is given by the sum of these three. And there's a small component from uh, precipitation sensible heat, which we actually take into account as well. And then what's going on in the atmosphere is balanced by the radiation at the top of the atmosphere and the surface fluxes, uh, the, the divergence of the atmospheric heat transports or energy transports. And in the ocean, it's, uh, we certainly have to take into account the storage term there, whereas in the atmosphere, it's relatively small. This uh, slide here, I don't have time to go this into any detail, but this is how we do these calculations. We use reanalyses and uh, do the calculations of all of these terms in considerable detail. And we've learned how to do these quite well, and it's critical that we actually balance both the water and uh, dry mass uh, budgets as well. And, uh, and this involves processing, in our case, many terabytes of data. And if you go to the latest reanalyses, ERA-5, actually petabytes of data. So this is a huge task. So the result then, here's the radiation at the top of the atmosphere that I showed you before. Here's the total heating that goes on in the atmosphere. Actually, this is not heating. It also includes moistening. And so that explains why uh, the subtropics tend to be emphasized because there's a lot of uh, evaporation that goes on in, into the subtropics. And then we see the large uh, fluxes into the atmosphere off, over the Kirishio and over the Gulf Stream in the wintertime in particular. And there's a lot of fascinating details in here. So why are these uh, different? Most people often think that this is what's going on in the atmosphere. It's not. This is the, this is the climate system. This is what's going on in terms of heating the atmosphere. And then the differences between these is the net surface flux. And that's what we get out of this. And uh, just about all of the features that are in here appear to be real. And so the blue areas are where heat is going into the ocean and the red areas are where heat is coming out of the ocean. And as a result, there has to be a transport by the ocean from the blue areas to the red areas, uh, something, something like this. And so if you look at the Arctic, that's nearly all uh, 
reddish or orange in the North Atlantic. The blue area in the Atlantic is not sufficient to compensate for that, and there's very little flow through the Bering Strait. And as a result, some of the heat in the Atlantic actually comes from the Pacific all the way around South America or sometimes even around uh, uh, Africa into the Atlantic. And we can do calculations of this kind of thing, which is really very interesting because we cannot get direct measurements of what the ocean is doing uh, from in situ measurements within the ocean. So here's what we're doing here. We're calculating the divergence of the energy flux uh, using this formula. And then what we're going to do is to take zonal averages for the moment and do the meridional heat trots flux uh, by integrating this quantity from where will we start off with the North Pole for the Atlantic and the Arctic uh, for the Bering Strait in the Pacific and we start in the South Asia for the Indian Ocean and then go southwards. And then we have often an imbalance at the Antarctic coast and we have to reconcile that with the top of the atmosphere radiation budgets. We have ways of doing that. Then the, uh, one of the complications for the Indian and Pacific Oceans is the Indonesian through flow and there is a net flow from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean and a net flow around Australia uh, like this, which means the, the mass budgets of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean are not closed by themselves. And so heat transports are not as well defined uh, under that circumstance. In fact, they're really not well defined. But what we've done is to do a calculation of this nature. Here's, here's the t global, here's the uh, atmosphere, here's the ocean with some error bars on it as the meridional transports. And then the ocean is the same value over here divided up into the Atlantic, uh, the Pacific, and the Indian. And now we've added in this component from the Indonesian through flow, uh, which we have as a function of time. And as I say, this is a bit artificial because the mass budgets of these are no longer closed. But this is, uh, this is what you get when you do that kind of thing. And over the Southern Oceans, of course, all these things are combined because of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. So one of the things we've been able to do now for the first time, I would say, is to estimate meridional heat transport. This is the annual, mean annual cycle. This is uh, global, uh, the Indo-Pacific and the Atlantic here. And let's see, these are uh, the, you know, the main transports that are occurring. And so in the Atlantic, it's northwards year round, except maybe in September and October, that's when it's the warmest in the Northern hemisphere. And so there's no requirement as much for the ocean to transport heat northwards, but otherwise the Atlantic's transporting heat northwards uh, most of the year and certainly in middle latitudes of the Northern hemisphere. The Indo-Pacific, however, has a very large annual cycle, which actually maximizes near eight degrees north, which is where the ITCZ uh, occurs, rather than on the equator, a very large amplitude. And we can see that being reflected in the global values. And so we can also uh, look at this from the standpoint of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, where we have accounted for the Indonesian uh, through flow. And uh, again, we see in the Pacific, this very large annual cycle of meridional heat transport that has profound influences on the, on the climate system. Eight petawatts is the annual cycle, that's huge. Then, of course, we can look at the time series of these things, and so we can go through here, uh, through 2016. Uh, this is the 12-month running mean values, so that we've got the total values here. And uh, down the bottom, I've taken out the mean annual cycle, and so we're looking at the departures, the, the anomalies, so-called. And, you know, it looks fairly blobby and you say, oh, isn't this noise? Well, actually, it's not. All of these things turn out to coincide with El Nino events and they're dominated in the in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll look at that in just a second here. So here's the Atlantic. Uh, the Atlantic has uh, quite substantial variability. The biggest uh, variations are associated with the North Atlantic oscillation, uh, these changes, and, and this record here that we've devised can be validated at, uh, at, at 26, 28 North uh, with the uh, rapid array in the ocean and uh, has quite good agreement, although we have slightly different trends, which may relate to the homogeneity of, homogeneity of the two different records. 
but we think we think this is a, a pretty good depiction of what's going on in the North Atlantic, and the main coherent transports are from the equator to about 45 degrees north. This is the Indo-Pacific uh, and uh, the southward transport in the southern hemisphere, uh, the northward transport, and here you can see the 2015-16 uh, El Nino event uh, showing up. And uh, what I'm going to focus on in the last part of this talk uh, is the uh, cross equatorial transports, the interhemispheric exchanges. And so now we can produce time series of these things. And so here's the global value in black. And you can see this quite large interannual variability, quite large fluctuations here. And here's 2015 16, it just went off the scale, in fact, uh, quite, quite remarkable associated with the 2015-16 El Nino event. If we break that down, this is what the Atlantic is doing across the equator. Uh, here's the Indian and, and here's the Pacific um, down here. And so the Pacific, you can see, is dominant in terms of the variability with regard to the global. You know, there's a tremendous amount of work going on with regard to what is called the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. But in the tropics and uh, subtropics, the what's going on in the Pacific is much, much greater than anything in the Atlantic. The Atlantic comes into its own in the higher latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. We've also got down here the atmospheric and the total top of the atmosphere uh, component. And, uh, and, and there's some numbers uh, down the bottom here. And on the right-hand side, I've just shown you some of the correlations between these curves. So the Pacific is correlated 0.97 with the global, the top of the atmosphere is hardly correlated at all with the global um, uh, cross-equatorial transports. And uh, the Atlantic and Indian Oceans are negatively correlated. <clears throat> you can see the Pacific and the Indian, by the way, they both go up and down together uh, through here, but then the Pacific goes crazy in 2015-16, and that greatly influences uh, any of these correlations. So here's the overall schematic of the flow of energy uh, across the equator in the three different oceans. Uh, there's uh, a flow uh, through here, one, one petawatt, uh, and redistribution over the southern oceans. There's a flow up into the Arctic and the North Atlantic, and you know, dispersed uh, through the through the Arctic, and on the right hand side, I've got the the overall changes uh, showing up, and then this is the um, the vertical depiction. The top of the atmosphere is given here. That's separate from the atmosphere here. We've got the overall atmosphere transporting heat into the southern hemisphere. Uh, the ocean is transporting heat northward, so that's mainly in the Atlantic. Uh, there's a flux into the uh, northern hemisphere and into the into the, uh, the southern hemisphere oceans to compensate for those, but there's a net imbalance here, which is 0 0.05 watts, uh, 0 0.05 petawatts in this case, which means that the southern ocean uh, is warming more than the northern hemisphere ocean, and that's mainly because the southern ocean is bigger than the northern hemisphere ocean. So this, these numbers all differ somewhat from previous, previously published versions. It turns out it depends a lot on the period and whether you've got the 2015-16 El Nino event included. Uh, also, we've got revised atmospheric energy transports and better representation of the ocean heat content. And so um, the differential storage between the oceans is also an important thing to take into account. So I'm going to close out by just uh, emphasizing uh, the potential for these kinds of methods to come into play. Of special note is the extremely large values here in 2016 associated with the El Nino event and the big changes in the Indone Indonesian through flow. And the values range from minus 0.3 to 1.2 petawatts uh, for the 12 month uh, running mean um, in terms of the transports meridionally. And if you don't include 2016, the range is, is certainly a lot less. And so these, the Earth's energy imbalance has implications for the future. You know, if I had longer, we could uh, link these to marine heat waves and, and hurricanes, uh, which, and, you know, there are profound consequences in both hemispheres. 
Uh, they bring in new kinds of information. And in fact, there's a lot of information in the coupled system that's not being utilized in many analyses. Uh, and it also constrains many data sets because these things have to add up. And it also constrains models that can be used to validate models. And thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Really appreciate that. So we've got some, uh, we've got a question coming in here for you. Uh, again, you're able to ask your questions using the questions area of your dashboard or feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you so you can ask Kevin your question live. First question is coming in from Priscilla. Uh, was the calculation of MHT using daily reanalysis data regarding what year the MHT anomalies were made? Well, I, I, I showed that we have we have these uh, meridional heat transports for every month. And so we do this every month from uh, 1979 on through 2017 is where we've got it now. Maybe we've got some for 2018. And what I emphasized here was the 12-month uh, running mean sort of annual values. Uh, that tends to eliminate some of the noise that occurs and so we have a little bit less confidence in the individual monthly values than we do in the the annual values uh, but uh, these values are available uh, from our website and one of our publications uh, has uh, a, a url where you can go and uh, access uh, all of these data as time series thank you kevin thank you for the question priscilla uh, we've got another question coming in from Janak or Yanak, I apologize. Uh, could there be a contribution of human power generation, e.g. hydroelectricity worldwide, to influence the global energy budget? Yes, so I had uh, uh, this, this um, brief mention here that we actually talk about uh, uh, how much um, Sorry, it was the, where was it? Uh, uh, where was the comparison I had with um, this one of these ones here, right? Um, let's see, this one. I, I actually had the comparison between the energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere versus the US uh, total electricity consumption, not just hydroelectric power, and uh, also the total global uh, electricity generation is really quite small compared with these, you know, quite modest changes in the top, in the top of the atmosphere radiation associated with the increases in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so energy consumption can be important locally. These values can get up to around 20 or 30 watts per square meter in big cities. And so you have an urban heat island effect. Uh, but on a global basis, they're relatively small. Did I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Um, any other questions for Kevin? We've got uh, about one more minute to go. So coming in from Amy, uh, what are the main reasons behind 2019 anomalies? Well, 2019 is the last year on record, and so that, since this talk was given originally in December 2019, I didn't actually have those. But here we 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 certainly have got 2019 values for the ocean heat content, and you know it's global warming, it's increases in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, is the is the primary thing that's happening, and a lot of that heat ends up in the ocean with the Argo array. We can now measure that much more precisely, but there is interesting variability spatially over over around the globe. Uh, in 2017, one of the warmest spots was in the Gulf of Mexico, and one of the consequences was Hurricane Harvey. In 2018, one of the warmest spots in the global ocean was off of the Carolinas, and the uh, result was uh, Hurricane Florence with uh, tremendous amounts of rainfall and so on. And then there are these marine heat waves, the thing called the blob, and there was a major marine heat wave off of Tasmania in the South Tasman Sea in association with the 2015-16 uh, El Nino event uh, because of the changes in the currents around Australia. And so 
all of these kind of things uh, come into play and help us understand why the local climate is varying the way it is. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I do see a couple of other questions that have come in. I will share those with Kevin offline so that Kevin can respond. Um, but for now, unfortunately, we do have to end this webinar. Before I do that, though, I want to thank Kevin and Allison very much for their presentations today. I've shared the links to their abstracts, so you're, you're welcome to reach out to them if you have any other questions or reach out to us here at AGU. We're happy to pass along your questions to them. We do have a couple of things. I want to thank Jim Hurel and Paul Newman from the Atmospheric Sciences section leadership. Um, they were integral in bringing this forward and uh, working with AGU staff to get this webinar produced. So I want to appreciate uh, them taking the time and effort to do that. Uh, you can find the seven other webinars in this series at their website where you can go ahead and register if you haven't already. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved with the section, uh, you can also reach out to them as well. They're always looking for uh, for new folks to, to help out with different projects like this one. Um, and my information at the bottom there, if you have any questions for AGU staff, anything we can do to help, we are here to answer your questions. So with that, I will go ahead and end today's webinar. Again, thank you to our speakers and to Atmospheric Sciences Leadership for presenting this webinar with AGU. Everybody Thanks have a great day. Thank you all.